so much of recovery is accepting all of it, all of the good and the supposed bad in, in me and the contradictions. I still have to work on that. You're listening to Make Some Noise Podcast, episode number 414 with guest Laura McCowan. Welcome to Make Some Noise Podcast, your guide for strategies, tools, and insight to empower yourself. I'm your host, Andrea Owen, global speaker, entrepreneur, life coach since 2007, and author of three books that have been translated into 18 languages and are available in 22 countries. Each week, I'll bring you a guest or a lesson that will help you maximize unshakable confidence, master resilience, and make some noise in your life. You ready? Let's go. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the podcast. I am so glad that you're here. I'm excited this morning because Laura McCowan is on the show. She's a longtime dear friend of mine, and it's been several years since she's been on, so you may have forgotten all about her story. So it'll be like hearing her on the show for the first time. And I also wanted to mention that if you purchased a copy of Make Some Noise, which I sincerely hope that you did, don't forget that there is the workbook that is available for free. It's still available. If you head on over to andreaowen.com slash noise, you can find that bonus over there. It's a great accompanying thing to be able to do the work instead of just read about it. Also wanted to mention that I have one spot open for private coaching. We can do kind of two different things. You have two options when you come to work with me. We can go through The Daring Way and Rising Strong or just one or the other, which is the modality based on the research of Brene Brown. I'm trained and certified in her work. I'm taking one person through it right now. And it's amazing. You learn brand new tools and get it in your bones so you can take that work with you into your life forever and ever. Amen. And also you can come and work with me without doing curriculum and you bring your own agenda. You bring your primary focus. And sometimes people have a goal that they want to accomplish and they just cannot seem to get past the obstacles. Or sometimes it's relationships that they're having a hard time setting boundaries. They've gone around in circles with someone or something and they need some guidance. And you can head over to andreaowen.com slash apply and fill out the application there. I also have Liz and Sabrina, who are my lead coaches that also work with clients, and that might be a better fit for you. So head on over to andreaowen.com slash apply, and my team will help you figure out what is the best fit for you. All righty then, for those of you who are new to Laura, let me tell you a little bit about her. Laura McCowan inspires people to say yes to a bigger life. She's the author of the best-selling memoir, We Are the Luckiest, The Surprising Magic of a Sober Life, and the founder and CEO of The Luckiest Club, a global sobriety support program. She has been featured in The New York Times, The Guardian, WebMD, Psychology Today, and The Today Show. Laura has an MBA from Boston College and lives with her daughter on the North Shore of Boston. So without further ado, here is Laura. Laura, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Hi. It's so fun to have you on here in a in a more professional setting. I know. I know. <laughs> It's been years and too. It's been years. I feel like the last time you were on was 2015 or 2016. No way. Yeah. Well, that's when I had my recovery series and, and we'll drop that link in the show notes. And that's why my first question is to ask you about your story because it's been so long since you've been on. <laughs> Even if people did listen to that, it's that a different show, story now. They, they don't remember. Yeah. No. And so can like, let's, let's dive into specifically your sobriety story, like how you went from working in advertising mm-hmm. and drinking to now being a sober person in recovery and teacher and author, speaker, all of those things. Okay. I know that's like a, that could take like 45 minutes. Yeah. I'll do it. I'll, <laughs> you could I'll give I'll us a condensed a version. Much quicker version. Yeah. I, uh, I was in marketing and advertising for 15 years. I was going to say I grew up in Colorado. I guess that is sort of relevant. I moved out to the East Coast. 
uh, right after college and I just started working in, in marketing and it was a very boozy culture. And I had, you know, arranged my life in every way uh, around fun and alcohol mm-hmm. and, and also working really hard. And I you know, went to grad school in out here. I still live here. I got married. I had a little girl in um, 12 years ago, and then I got divorced. And that all happened around, uh, well, I had her in 2009, but I, then I sort of started to hit the wall with drinking pretty quickly after I had my daughter. It was not great before. And then mm. it changed, uh, you know, pretty badly after I had her, and uh, I it started. I say it's, it didn't work anymore. <laughs> didn't work yeah. the same way it used to. And so, that shortly after that, I got divorced, and then the wheels really came off. And between 2013 and 2014, I started to earnestly work towards getting sober, uh, earnestly and reluctantly. I did not want to get sober. I thought it was the end of everything. Uh, and you know, I, like I said, I had arranged my life, everything in my life was connected to, to drinking. And I really didn't know how to, how to break up with it. And, you know, I didn't know what my life meant. And I started to write my way through that, I'm right. My way through understanding that, processing that, and I started to publish things originally just on my blog, which had you know all of like a dozen readers. But I started to post things to Facebook. I eventually you know pitched them to sm- some small publications online, and I started getting traction that way. And then I also started a podcast called Home in 2015, and that took off. And uh, it opened up this whole, I, basically, I started to talk and write my way through getting sober. Mm-hmm. And I had long wanted to be a writer. It felt like a ridiculous pipe dream. At that point, I was 35, 36. I had you know, already had a career. I had invested so much energy and time and resources and all of those things into it. And it, it just seemed like there's no way I could, how does one become an author? all of a sudden, yeah. but Just magically, yeah. yeah. <laughs> How does that work? And, but I still held this idea or this dream. And as I started to work towards it, um, meaning I continued to podcast, I continued to write, I continued to build a little bit of a following on social media and things like that. Eventually after a couple years of doing that, and a couple of years of sobriety, I got sober finally in 2014, the stars aligned in such a way that I was able to make a leap with you know, a little bit of security, like six months worth. And I just mm-hmm. decided to go for it. And uh, that was in 2016. I what is it? 2021 now. And I have just since then, you know, I started off doing workshops and retreats. I have been, I have been a yoga teacher for a really long time. And I started teaching online classes that I created around personal development and sobriety. And my first book came out, We Are the Luckiest came out last year in 2020, in January. And, uh, that went really well. And I started a company or a sobriety support group uh, community rather last year in the pandemic called the luckiest club. And I've just been, you know, following the breadcrumbs ever since Mm -hmm. I got sober really. And uh, I'm now currently in the process of writing my second book. So that's a very, the very condensed version. (laughs) The short, the short three minute version. Well, it's, it's, been so wonderful to watch your progress and and you know kind of knowing you online as a as a baby sober person <laughs> and and also watching like how awkward that is to navigate like not only in your personal life 
with the people around you, but then to do it online. Yeah. And I'll be honest, like I always worry a little bit when I see people come out who are brand new sober yep. and they're doing it out loud Yeah, because I've seen people have that be their detriment yeah. and, and have that take away from their recovery. I don't think that's the case with any, with everyone. No, nope. it depends on the person. And, but I do always like, like the mama bear in me is like, always like, Oh, please be careful. <laughs> well, totally. Because it is, it's an intensely private process and there's no, yes. And it's very raw in the beginning. Yeah. And, and anything that seems like a shortcut usually is you know, mm -hmm. whether you get into a relationship right away and everything's grand and, you know, you're sort of able to ride that out or you get a lot of success because you're able to get your word out, you know, and, or you're, I mean, <clears throat> the, the thing is, if you do it out loud, you're doing it in front of an audience. And so some part of your internal process becomes performative and right. How could it not? So you, you know, you're going to get some kind of feedback, right? Yeah. I mean, that have definitely happened to me at times. Mm -hmm. I realized I was way out, out ahead of my skis and uh, it you pay for it. I, yeah. So yeah, I, I hear you on that. Yeah. It can be tricky. And then for some people, they use it as account an accountability measure yeah. and it works for them. Yeah. Well, I, I, mean, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time here, but I do want to ask you because I'm sure that you get people who come into your community and into your membership group who are, because um, I forget, do you identify as an alcoholic? No, I don't. Okay. I just, I, it's not because well, I don't. Let me pause there and ask you about that. Okay. Tell me why. I just, to me, the word, no one hears the word alcoholic and thinks anything. Can't wait. It feels just punitive <laughs> to me. Totally. It's definitely not a term of endearment. No, it's, it just feels such a, there's so much weight to that word. Mm -hmm. And I, it's not that I don't, I'm under any illusion that I can drink in safety or that I don't have a, you know, significant problem with alcohol. I, I, it's not that it's just, it never felt right coming out of my mouth. And I just don't say it. I honestly, I don't need, like, I don't want to sound flippant, but I just don't care. Yeah. Like, I, I don't need to say that. I just don't need to say Some it. Some people do who, who identify. Totally. I'm kind of indifferent. I don't care if people do. I think use whatever words, as long as you're not bullshitting yourself. Right. Use whatever <laughs> words you want. <laughs> don't use it as a way to completely be in denial. Right. Um, I personally for sure identify as an addict. Like mm. uh, my, when people, when I go on sobriety podcasts and they ask me, you know, did you have a rock bottom moment or the moment you knew you needed to get sober? And I say yes and no. Like my rock bottom moment was in my love addiction and codependency years yeah. prior. Alcohol was just the thing that I grabbed onto when I started healing from codependent and love addiction behaviors. And, and Within a couple of years, I knew that I needed to quit that as well. It was it, for me; it was just the symptom. So, do I have addict thinking? One hundred percent. I yes. feel like I just was very blessed that I never found heroin or meth mm -hmm. or got too deep into cocaine, mm -hmm. um, because I would have been a drug addict. Yeah, I, I definitely identify as an addict too. I don't walk around saying that. Not it, uh, mm -hmm. it just doesn't come up in conversation. But it, as you're right. it's like, of course, yes. I seem to be my life. Uh, path seems to be quitting things over and over again. <laughs> right. <laughs> My growth path seems to be, well, what are we going to have to quit this year, Laura? <laughs> well, and you and I were having a converse, an offline conversation, I think just earlier this week. And I said, my thing with relationships has always been how fast can I, what did I say? How fast can I run into your face? How fast can I run into your face? <laughs> That's, that was my goal. Uh, How fast can I get into this relationship? Yep. Fall in love. Yep. Make you my world. Yep. Be obsessed with you and hopes that you are obsessed with me. Yeah. <laughs> and then it all explodes. Yeah. <laughs> How long can we go on like that before we actually open our eyes? I used to half joke that I would run around corners with my eyes closed and my arms open. Like that's oh, how I, I so really ran into all of my relationships. Yeah. Like, friendships. Yep romantic partners. And it's not, it's only until now 
you know, in my mid thirties, I think where I started to realize through therapy and recovery, like, oh, that's, that might be my habits and my coping mechanisms and part of my personality, I feel like, but that is not working me. And that is not how healthy relationships work with anything or anyone. Yeah. I, and it's a big light bulb when you figure that out. Cause it's like, wait, isn't it supposed to feel like that? No, it's actually not, you know, it's not. Okay. Well, tell us about your book, which I'm holding right in front of me. It's Mm -hmm. called We Are the Luckiest, The Surprising Magic of a Sober Life. And it's, I love this book because it is part memoir. And please tell me if I'm totally wrong, but I took it as part memoir, part self-help where you tell stories Mm -hmm. about your own personal experiences around drinking and that kind of behavior. And then what you have done to heal from it. Yeah. I think that's pretty, pretty much right. I, I would say I always say it's a memoir. I feel like it's 95% memoir. And then I, but I am talking directly to the reader often and saying, Mm -hmm. uh, there is a little prescriptive stuff in there. So yeah, that's, that's true. Uh, the book is, it's about my experience of getting sober from alcohol. And I really focus a lot on that there was a period of time, I call it purgatory between when I, I did have a bottom. It wasn't the end of my drinking, but the the lowest point of my drinking was leaving my daughter alone in a hotel room when she was four year old, four years old overnight, because I was blacked out. It was at my brother's wedding. And that's where the book starts. And mm-hmm. I, that's when I, shortly after that, I went to my first uh, 12 step meeting. And that was the first time I'd ever really said, okay, this is something I have to do. There was a year and a half before I actually got sober. And it was one of the, well, it was the most excruciating year and a half of my life. And, but not only excruciating, it was everything. And I, because I did taste sobriety in that time. And for the first time as an adult, really as a, I mean, since I was 16, I tasted what it was like to not be hung over for an entire week or mm-hmm. do work without hangovers, try to navigate having a conversation, let alone a conversation with someone I was attracted to and try to do all these things that I you know, have all these feelings that I hadn't felt. And so I focus a lot on the emotional experience of getting sober, because for me, that was that's what I'm most interested in through people's stories, not just my own, but through, through stories that I read too. And, you know, just what, how deep the shame goes and how extraordinary the guilt and the the grief was of letting mm-hmm. it go. And uh, all the dynamics of my relationships with my ex-husband and my mother, who was very tied into my drinking and mm, friends and people I men I was dating and, and such. So, I take, it's a lot of it uh, goes through that first year. And then I also focused a lot on what it was like after I got sober, you know, the, the couple years after, because that is, you know, a lot of stories sort of drop off. A lot of quitlet stories sort of drop off after they get sober. Mm-hmm. And yeah. it's like, man, that part is, is worth talking about. So, Yes. Well, and, and this book, I think I, it definitely is helpful for people who know that they have a troubled relationship with alcohol or, you know, and they're thinking about getting sober or they, ha- they are sober, but talk to us about the people, you know, do you have people that enter your program who are sober curious? Mm-hmm. Tell us about that. Yeah. I, the, the book, I actually, one of the main things I have really tried to convey with the book and that I try to convey in all my work is that addiction is not even that interesting. It's a completely human condition. We're all addicted in some way. And Mm -hmm. if it's not addiction, I'm just mostly interested in the things that shatter our concept of self as we know it and usually cause us such extraordinary pain that we're invited to live in a different way. My invitation happened to be through addiction, but 
everyone has a thing. I talk yeah. about that in the book. It's, it could be divorce. It could be losing someone you love. It could be chronic illness or just horrible illness. It could be all kinds of things. We all have something. We often have many things. <laughs> mm-hmm. And <laughs> it's a plethora. So I wrote, I really don't see it is this story is primarily about alcohol addiction. Yes, but pain is a human story and struggle is a human story. And these types of invitations to wake up to our lives, which is how I see it, is a completely human story. And so I get people, yes, that are sober curious. Uh, and I'll go back to that in a second, but I also get people that really don't struggle with alcohol at all. That's not their thing, but they have something else. You know, lots of people who've struggled with food, lots of people who struggled with getting over a relationship or grief. You know, mm-hmm. I ha- it is it was really important to me and it is really important to me to take this specialness out of the story of addiction. And what do you mean by that? Like it's just not that interesting. It's not unique. Okay. Oh, you mean just the specificity of yeah. addiction yeah, with, like, to substance, chemical addiction? Yeah, mm-hmm. it's like there's nobody that's not addicted. Right. Nobody. And yet I think for, for most people it's it's process addiction versus chemical addiction. And then that's mm-hmm. the thing that it's it's hard to pinpoint. Mm-hmm. Yep. And you know, addiction is a very human condition. It's w- documented in every historical, sociological, anthropological record from the beginning of time, you know, it's in every Mm -hmm. wisdom text they talk about, they talk, they call it different things, but it's, it's a human condition to grasp and to seek pleasure and to escape pain. So that's what I mean. And as far as sober curiosity goes, it's an interesting phenomenon because you and I both know that problematic drinking exists on a spectrum and a big one. It's a very big spectrum. And I would say up until, I don't know, five years ago, there was this, and, and still, I would say, largely, um, but it's changing. There's this binary thinking. You can either drink with impunity or mm-hmm. you can't because you're an alcoholic. And right. It's just not the truth. There several studies have come out at uh, one just came out again in a, about a month ago that said there's no safe amount of alcohol, you know, alcohol, any amount of alcohol causes brain damage. I, I don't like, I'm not a prohibitionist. I'm not against people drinking at all. I'm just fascinated with the way that we have created this myth around alcohol in our culture so that, you know, it's such a big deal to quote unquote, have a problem with it when in reality it is just probably, it's a, it's a drug and it's, it's problematic for a lot of people in just different ways. And um, so the sober curious thing, yeah, I get people who like, for example, my boyfriend would never have qualified as an alcoholic. He is someone who though consistently like a lot of people had alcohol in his life, right? He'd go to shows. Mm -hmm. He would go out to drinks with friends. He would go to dinner. It was kind of constant, but never, or very rarely a problematic thing. And yet he read my book and was like, God, I'd never like really thought about it this way that it might be keeping me from something. I don't even know about, right? This like maybe Mm -hmm. extra 10% of my, my potential or my awareness or my presence. Mm -hmm. And so he stopped drinking and he's like, I didn't, I have feel like I have a superpower. And so he's someone I suppose who would be sober curious maybe, but I'm finding there's a lot of that, that people come in and just say, I don't have a, I don't feel like I have a good reason why I need to stop. And people think they need a reason, but like, Mm -hmm. I just have this gnawing sense that maybe it's not the best, not doing me any favors. Yeah. Maybe I should try it. Maybe I should try it. Right. It's always, so this is kind of like a side note. And I feel like we've talked about this a while ago, but the people online, and it's typically women that I see Mm -hmm. when, you know, you or I, or anybody in the sober community speaks out, especially against 
mommy wine culture and, and, you know, just how obsessed our society is with alcohol and that there's some pushback, like there's people who get defensive. And I think when you, when you get defensive about something, sometimes that is an indicator that something is against your values. Like if somebody Mm -hmm. goes online and says, trans people are weird, you would get defensive because you believe in equality and, right. you know, tolerance and, right. uh, you know, like that type of thing, like that, that kind of defense being defensive is warranted, but it's so interesting to me when people push back and get defensive, it's almost like the gun people come out, you know, mm-hmm. like how they are like, don't take away our guns. It's like, <laughs> no one's trying to take away your booze. <laughs> like <laughs> we're not. We're not trying to change legislature. Like, of course, drunk driving is bad, but like we, all we're doing is spreading awareness and asking questions for people to maybe think more about their choices and their coping mechanisms and the, you know, just their whole thinking. Yeah. Well, that's part of what I'm talking about when I say the cultural sort of story we have around alcohol. It's just really interesting when you break it down because- there are more deaths you know, caused by alcohol than any, than all the other drugs mm-hmm. combined, including illegal drugs and prescription drugs. There's, you know, that just goes on and on, but we don't think of it like a drug. It's like alcohol and drugs. It's like, no. And, and I think people's reaction to that is just some of it is not wanting to be judged. And I totally get that. And I, I don't ever say these things in judgment. I, I don't. Mm-hmm. I say it because for me, it was, I knew when I went to get sober, I felt like I was screaming at the bottom of a well, because it was like, this is not just a Laura has a drinking problem thing. This is, we're all under this mass delusion that, that this isn't problematic until it is. And then like, where's this imaginary line? Because if I looked all around me, everyone drank like I did. They really did. There was just this line that they didn't cross. Like, and so I, I, I think it's just people love their alcohol too. Like Mm -hmm. you want to keep it. And I get that. And it's, it's, my intention is never to judge or to proclaim that everyone needs to abstain from drinking or anything like that. It's just like, ask these, these, these interesting questions that sort of challenge the entire paradigm that we have around drinking. And it's like you poke it and you see, oh, there's a lot, (laughs) there's a lot in there because these reactions are interesting, right? I'm just going to say, I feel like if you see something like that, where I'm thinking of one thing that Desiree Attaway posted, it was at the beginning of last school year, there was a, I don't know what store it was at, but there was a display of wine and the sign said something about virtual learning. It's helper. Trader Joe's. It was Trader Joe's. I thought it was, but I didn't want to throw Trader Joe's under the bus. I, I love, love Trader them. Joe's. Yeah. But yeah, they was, missed the mark. That on was that not one. great. And, and, and Desiree Attaway, who's an anti-racism educator, you know, talks about white supremacy. She was talking about that and mm-hmm. capitalism and, and patriarchy and stuff and how it's harming women. Anyway, the comments, like people mm. got pissed off. And I remember thinking to myself, I feel like if I did not have any kind of super attachment to alcohol, I would have just scrolled on by and I wouldn't have cared. Yep. I would have been like, oh, that's an interesting opinion. I don't agree with it, but whatever. Yeah. Not, not my argument. So if someone is so inclined to die up on that hill, I feel like you might want to check yourself. Like there might be something there. Yeah. I I, to- I know. It's really interesting to watch. If you compare it mm-hmm. to, to like cigarettes in the seventies or something, or even sixties, even eighties, I suppose before, I think it was the eighties when we really started to wake up about it. Yeah. And people, (laughs) I know. Right. It, it was similar, you know, Mm -hmm. it was, no one questioned it. It was a very in vogue thing to do. Doctors even recommended it. You could smoke literally anywhere. And now Mm -hmm. there are some, there's some taboos around smoking in certain places. There's laws against it in many places. And it's just kind of fell out of, of cultural favor. Right. But drinking 
it's a bang up marketing job on the part of big alcohol for sure. And it's also, I'm, I'm, I know we don't want to like talk about this the whole time, but I'm truly fascinated by the cultural element of it. The, the myth that we've created around it. I I'm truly fascinated at how much we love our alcohol and Mm -hmm. protect it. Right. To the point where you see someone, you, the, the data is right in front of our face. Like we talk about the opioid crisis, right? Mm -hmm. It's tiny, teeny, 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 tiny compared to the alcohol crisis. Mm -hmm. It doesn't even come close, but we can't, no one wants to hear that. (laughs) No, (laughs) no, no. So it's just study after study proves it. Yeah. It's just, it's one of those things where I just constantly go, this is a fascinating cultural study. It, mm-hmm. The way that we have blindfolded or uh, it's like, it's a mixture of social acceptance, marketing, like indoctrination, all of these things that it's a, it's a man, someone should at some point, maybe I will, maybe you will, maybe someone will create just <laughs> a, a really fascinating study. There's been bits and pieces of it, but I don't think it's time yet. I don't think people want to hear it quite yet. It's just, uh, and big alcohol we are a country in denial. Big, yeah. We're a country in denial and big alcohol about, about a few things. Big <laughs> alcohol is big too. You know, it's, it's massive. It goes all it the is. way up to the levels of government. But anyway, I don't want to steer too far into it. It, and if I was someone, you know, someone is, um, I guess the bottom line is I would have tuned out this type of conversation like 15 minutes ago because mm-hmm. I wasn't hearing it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. It's not, it's not for me. It's not for me. Well, it, it will be when it's, when it's time. I am interrupting this conversation to bring you a few words from some of our sponsors. Y'all, the holidays are quickly approaching and most of us are busy to some extent. My family, we are traveling to San Diego and Vegas this year. As you know, life around this time can be stressful, and it's so important to prioritize taking care of yourself, and that's why I love Banyan Botanicals. They are an Ayurvedic company with products and guides that make me feel great and help me focus on my wellness from the inside and out. Banyan Botanicals takes a holistic approach to health. They offer tons of free guides and resources that are so helpful in coping with holiday stress. My recent favorite of theirs, I've talked about a few different products that I use, and I love their Banyan Botanicals Turmeric Milk Mix. It's the perfect cozy winter drink, and it supports digestion and health circulation. Plus, it's caffeine-free, which is important to me because I drink it in the afternoon. To top it off, Banyan Botanicals is a certified B corporation and is committed to sustainability. Banyan Botanicals products offer effective support for your life going into this holiday season. And I have a special offer for my listeners, 20% off your first purchase, and that is good site-wide. Just go to banyanbotanicals.com slash noise and make sure you try the turmeric milk mix, B-A-N-Y-A-N botanicals.com slash noise, banyanbotanicals.com slash noise. You've heard many of the guests here on the podcast who are licensed therapists, and you know I encourage everyone to go to therapy. I'm proud to have BetterHelp as one of our sponsors because there's so many things I love about their service. When you sign up for BetterHelp, they'll assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. You'll get timely and thoughtful responses, plus you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions. It's more affordable than traditional offline counseling and financial aid is available. Their license Licensed professional counselors specialize in things like depression, stress, anxiety, relationships, sleeping, trauma, anger, family conflicts, LGBT matters, grief, self-esteem, and their service is available for clients worldwide. I want you to start living a happier and more fulfilling life today. As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor at BetterHelp.com dot com slash kickass. Join over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash kickass. One of the things that I find incredibly overwhelming is food. (laughs) 
know. But it's the whole process of it. It's the planning. It's the deciding. It's the shopping. It's the prepping. It's the cooking. Like all of it. And this is one of the many reasons I love Green Chef. They are the number one meal kit for eating well. And the ingredients come pre-measured. They are perfectly portioned, mostly prepped, so you can spend less time stressing and more time enjoying delicious home-cooked meals. They offer 30 weekly recipe options. And I love that amount because it's just enough to have a really great selection, but not too many to where you have decision fatigue and are just super overwhelmed. You can also switch up your plan whenever you're ready to try a new way of eating. Green Chef is the best meal kit, whether you're keto, paleo, vegan, vegetarian, gluten-free, which is what my doctor has recommended because of this hypothyroid thing that we're trying to figure out. So, you know, another reason I love them. Uh, If you're a pescatarian or you just want to eat more balanced meals. I love using them because I get to cook with my husband and it's not stressful. It's just all right there. We get to enjoy each other and have a good time cooking. This deal that they're offering right now to y'all is absolutely amazing. Go to greenchef.com slash kickass125 and use code kickass125 to get $125 off, including free shipping. It's greenchef.com slash kickass125 and use code kickass125 to get $125 off, including free shipping. I absolutely love them. I think you will too. And thank you so much for supporting our sponsors because when you do, that in turn supports this show. I want to shift gears slightly and talk Mm -hmm. about, um, I know that a good portion of your work focuses on people reclaiming their power Mm -hmm. after becoming sober. So what in what are some ways in which a newly sober person can learn to hear and speak their truth and kind of renew their sense of meaning and purpose? Yeah. The it's something that it feels like it's very cliché to say reclaim your power and all of the that. But but I mean it. I I actually really mean it. We especially especially women, I find get very lost in the roles that they play and alcohol or any other let's let's even leave alcohol behind and just say we find ways to cope with the pain of things we've endured and the ways that we abandon ourselves right abandon mm-hmm. our voice abandon what we know abandon what we want and we do that unconsciously mostly. And we, I, I, I mean, thousands of women at this point, and there's some men in there too, get to the point where at the, you know, by the time they're say their kids have grown up, that's usually when it happens or some, at some point in their kids growing up, they realize they don't have a sense of identity and, or they've put the sense of identity that they do have is really, I'm a mother. I am a, I'm my job, you know, Mm -hmm. and they don't, you ask them what they want. They want to eat for dinner or what they're, if they're tired right now, or if they're hungry right now and they don't know. Yeah. And it's such a, and, and that kind of dislocation from yourself is it requires relief and people find it through alcohol. They find it through their phones, they find it through whatever. We have a million ways to ease that pain. And when you take away the alcohol or you take away whatever it is that is helping you to numb that, you're left with this sort of vacuum. You have a choice to maybe get curious about that (laughs) and ask some questions about who you are and what you want. And the number one thing I always tell people to start doing is just writing things down. It sounds again kind of cliche, but it actually works. It's science. It's scientifically proven. It works. <laughs> write mm-hmm. some. Write some shit down. Like get a pen and paper. It's the most. It's also available anytime and for free. Just start writing in the morning, like how you feel, and be honest. <laughs> What's mm-hmm. going on with you? How do you feel about your relationships? How does your body feel? What are you? Are you? do you have any meaning in your days? Like what is giving you meaning? What's not? 
burn those pages if afterwards, if that's what is required for you to be honest, but start doing that. And what that really is, is having, is getting thoughts and feelings that are inside of you, outside of you. So putting them on the page and I really getting them out of your body, right. And starting to gently (laughs) unearth the subconscious and allow, it's like, I just started gardening this year and it's like, there's parts of my, uh, I've never, I've never dug a hole in the earth. I've never tried to plant anything. And it's interesting and all kinds of metaphors, but there's parts of my outdoors that haven't been dug up for years. You can tell. And if you put the shovel in, it feels like you're hitting rock right away, but you're really Mm -hmm. not. You're hitting like just roots upon roots upon roots. And if you let, if I stamp stomp on the shovel, it'll go down like difficultly, but it'll go down. And then you start to pull things up. And once you start to get in there, it's easier to get in there. And it's not easy, but it's very useful. So writing. Um, The other thing is to (laughs) learn about boundaries. Oh, boundaries. (laughs) When you were naming all those things that like people you know, like might be addicted to. And I, I, that was what I thought. I'm like, poor boundaries. Yeah. (laughs) Having no boundaries. boundaries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Having none. Just start to dip your toe in the water of learning about them. I mean, bound learning boundaries is like a lifelong process, but I have found in the way in, in teaching people that once they start to hear about this, the concept of boundaries, what they are, and they realize, and they, and they look at their own lives. I think it's the source of you know, 90% of sort of interpersonal problems and pain. Yep. I would agree with that. So just start to learn. There's all kinds of books. I always tell people to listen to the Rob Bell podcast, the Rob Cast uh, mm-hmm. episode on boundaries. If you just Google Rob Bell boundaries, he has one of the best podcasts on boundaries ever. So there's that. And then just, I think once you start to even get a little curious about this type of thing and and have an ounce of willingness, the opportunities to explore that sort of surface naturally and organically mm-hmm. in your life, right? The next book will show up. You'll have an, a conflict in your, one of your relationships where you'll go, huh, okay, what was happening there? And then obviously mm-hmm. there's all the, the you know, therapy. I'll, I always recommend therapy and working with coaches and you know, just investing that time and reading and, and all of that. I love that plan. And I want to, I want to tag on one more thing. Cause I'm thinking about the people listening yeah. and thinking about them sitting down to journal, whether it's, you know, the notes app in their phone or, or on their computer or pen and paper. And my addition to that is don't judge whatever comes up or try your Mm -hmm. best not to Mm -hmm. because what inevitably happens when people start to get curious and I've done this too, is like we immediately label it as good or bad, right or wrong. Yes. You know, like if, if you're still hung up about a past relationship, like why should be over that by now, they were so terrible to me or, and I'm so terrible. I'm married. I can't believe I'm still thinking about this person. Oh my God, shut it down. Right. (laughs) And it's just, when you notice yourself judging, if you are judging, just notice it's sort of like what they teach us in meditation. Not that I'm any good at this, but you notice the thoughts come in and you look at them as if they're passing clouds. Well, aren't those interesting? And there they go. Yeah. If you, you can't beat yourself up into more curiosity, into betterment, into yeah. self-actualization. Nope. It doesn't work that way. It just makes you feel shitty. So totally. I, I, I'm sure you know of Kristen Neff, but yes. my therapist a few years ago recommended I read self compassion. I was like, I'm fine. Mm-hmm. I'm not, I'm, I have plenty of self compassion. She's like, yeah. She gets into the nitty gritty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's funny, Laura. Go read it. And <laughs> I was like, oh, oh, because we, we do, we, we, we've been raised to think conditioned to think that there are good feelings, bad feelings, right feelings, wrong feelings, and good thoughts, bad thoughts, and all that they're they're not there mm-hmm. are what the and and that's what gets us into this thick water too is like or deep water is 
trying to not feel what we feel. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. And that just by willing it away, it will go away. And we don't, no one gets away with anything. I know that for sure. Like oh, I have tried. Yeah. <laughs> trust me. <laughs> Which I think everyone listening has as well. Yeah. I have tried, but it, it isn't going away. So you got to look at that thing and learn to love it. And so much of recovery is about that for me is acceptance, accepting all of it, all of the good and the supposed bad in, in me and the contradictions. And, you know, that I'm still, I still have to work on that. And there will be times when I have thoughts that are absolutely like degenerate thoughts. You know, I, like, I wish that person would just fall into a hole in the earth and die. I will have like a thought like that. And it's like, really, (laughs) really? And it's like, okay, so that's a, that's a thought that we have, you know, interesting. Mm -hmm. So what, what's next? Uh, and the longer you go, the, the the longer I go, the more I realize it's all in there. We're capable of everything. You know, we're capable of thinking You just got to push the shovel down. You got to push the shovel down, cut the roots and just like see what's inside, but dig around, dig around, hmm, find the worms, <laughs> dirt under your fingernails. Mm-hmm. Oh, hey, everyone. The book is We Are the Luckiest, The Surprising Magic of a Sober Life. Of course, the, all those links will be in the show notes, including the, the previous episode that Laura was on where, where she goes more in depth about her story of getting sober. And uh, anything else that, that you want to say? Where do you want? I know you're taking an Instagram break, but by the time this episode comes out, <laughs> you might actually be back. So where do you want people to go to find out more about you? Maybe to find out more about The Luckiest Club. Yeah, go to my website because I may or may not be back on Instagram, but everything's at my website, which is my name, lauramcowan.com. There's a, there are links to all my all my work and my books and The Luckiest Club as well is, is linked from there. Perfect. All right, everyone, you know how much I am so incredibly grateful for your time and that you choose to spend it with me and my guests. And remember, it's our life's journey to make ourselves better humans and our life's responsibility to make the world a better place. Bye for now. Hey, everyone. Thanks again for listening to the show. And just a quick reminder that if your company needs a speaker or a trainer, I might be the right person for you. I speak and do keynotes on confidence and resilience for mixed audiences, as well as do trainings on The Daring Way, which is the methodology based on the research of Dr. Brene Brown. So if you think it might be a good fit, hit me up at support at andreaowen.com or head over to my speaking page, andreaowen.com slash speaking.